everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is going to be the discussion on our uh, access to risk and uh, the extent they actually is. We've got um, two speakers today. I think we have a final discussion. Uh, Brian is co director of the New Learning Alliance Theory Solves Program, a board member and co founder of the London Institute of State AI and the management rebrander. Previously, he completed a PhD in physics at the University of Queensland and ran the new PA group for three years. Brian takes a lot of interpretive theory and topology. He is deeply concerned about near term act risk and safeguarding in the future. So, why can you take the taking AI a really risk seriously and why they are a threat? Okay, James. Everyone, James, who you, most of you I mentioned better now, is a PhD student in the Business Risk and Financial Science Program. He studied graduate studies in Physics Generally at the University of Melbourne and a Master's degree in Neuroscience at the ANU. He has also worked as a research assistant in Structural Biology at Monash University. Outside of research, James is a key interest in science, philosophy, and physics. He's passionate about effective activism, looking forward to that his work from the animal, animal welfare. Uh, Ryan's going to start us off, then we're going to have a discussion, and then we'll have safety questions. So you probably don't do it now, but just pop in the top part and we'll go next. Cool. Thanks very much, Ryan. James. Well, I might be using my phone a bunch, uh, mostly because, like, I'm really tired. I went from uh, San Francisco a few days ago, and my, my jet lag is still kicking my ass. So, okay. I shared a link in the Slack, not in the Slack, in the uh, chat for this particular Dino Swap card. It's like a Notion document. It's got, like, a bunch of cascading... Uh, West, but it's basically on four main points I have. Um, James and I decided we'd like use Joe Carl Smith's report on his power signature central risk as like a kind of foundation. So we have like some common ground. Uh, we might disagree with aspects of it as well, which is kind of cool. Whatever. I don't know how this is going to go. It's going to be fun. Um, <laughs> my opening statement is basically like a uh, four part thesis. I think AGI will probably occur in like 10 to 20 years. By AGI, I mean like AI that can like perform pretty much like all. Uh, cognitive tasks as well as humans, not necessarily the best humans, but as well as like, I don't know, the median human. Um, AI can defeat all of humanity combined. So uh, this is like conditional on the first one or something. So conditional on having this kind of AGI, I think like uh, in the right circumstances, it's just like, I don't know, millions of these things running in parallel with the right kind of like, you know, uh, infrastructure could probably outmaneuver all of humanity via a bunch of exploitable mechanisms in civilization. Um, nothing like super weird, just like, you know, bioterrorism, you know, cyber crime, and like, like just being better at coordinating for a bunch of reasons, um, you know, just autonomous weapons and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, I think humans will probably build AI agents, uh, like whether or not they're aligned. I think they probably, there's just massive incentives to do this. Uh, and I think the risk of powerful AI agents disempowering humanity is unacceptably high, according to me. Um, so we might have different tolerance threshold, we might have different probabilities for that. Uh, I think we might disagree on mostly the second. Um, and I think alignment is like probably kind of hard uh, or, or control sufficient for bootstrapping alignment. Um, and I kind of, I just kind of co-opted Davidad, David Dalrymple's uh, kind of 12 cruxes for alignment being hard, uh, which I can speak about, but I'm, I'm, I'm an expert in none of this stuff. So I'm just gonna like speak about my personal cruxes uh, and I'd love to, Take audience questions after I guess we're discussing. We have time for the yes, we okay. I'm done. <laughs> cool. Um, thanks, Ryan. So let's see where to start. So um, just as a recap, um, the paper that we've decided to use for uh, the basis of this discussion is called "Is Power Seeking AI an Existential Risk?" by uh, Carl Smith. What's his first name? Joseph Carl. Joseph. Yeah, Joseph Carl Smith. If anyone wants to. Uh, grab that up and have a scroll through while we're chatting. It would be useful. But do a handful of who's read the book. Yeah, if you like. And anyone who's read the paper or a little bit of it, either. Wow. Okay. You. Um, cool. So, I mean, we're not going to go through page by page or anything, but one of the things that he um, kind of advances in this paper is the idea of, of APS systems, so advanced planning, strategically aware systems. I wondered if you, I mean, this is a bit different to your term of AGI, but. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe it's a way of unpacking it, or um, maybe you could tell us more about what you think the key components are um, of AGI, whether it's the same as Carlson before. Yeah, so, okay. So, so the most worrying components, man. Uh, most worrying components. All right, so I'll, okay, I'll talk about this from the perspective of near-term uh, AGI, which I think is like the thing I'm most concerned about. I think like if AGI, if you can't build it near-term, that means language models don't pan out the way that I expect they will. And you end up with like some radically different system that just looks extremely different to what we, what I, what I currently expect to be in. 
So in the median, I expect like uh, something like auto GPT uh, is, is kind of the form of the thing that like will constitute AGI. I think like people will build these in a way that they'll have APS capabilities. Um, so what do I mean by this? Well, uh, so there's, I have like a paper somewhere in there, but basically it's like for a few of like large language models for, um, for agency. So you can imagine like a language model would play the role of like a central controller. Like imagine a global workspace theory of consciousness. You have some central controller. You have a bunch of like backend tools the central controller can use effectively. They could be like scratch pads for like keeping like for memory, some sort of structured memory architecture. It could be like tools like Wolfram Mathematicus and logic engines. It could be like um, sensors and actuators of various types, right? Uh, so sensors are like ways of perceiving the world, certain like maybe like soft, like, like I don't know, your eye, your eye processes images, right? So you have some like, like Gatto, you know, DeepMind genomics model has some sort of way of perceiving the world via multimodal text and image inputs. Um, you can think of this as some of the, the accessory inputs your AI, this AGI system might have. Uh, the way we kind of do advanced, advanced capabilities, um, have like strategic planning and um, strategic awareness. Uh, these would be, I expect these kind of things would be, there'd be some essential core of intelligence encoded in just, I don't know, training on the internet and training on like massive image data. Uh, you kind of like, you, you get a lot of the weight there of that. Uh, and then like in building the auto GPT, which is like this language model kind of using all these tools, um, probably also like some sort of scaffolding where it can do chain of thought prompting for itself, kind of keep a sequential memory. Um, you probably like train it uh, in a bunch of different environments. So you probably train it via self play against other such agents in suitably rich physics environments that like online. Uh, you probably like maybe put it like you give it like basically a bunch of these different like interactive elements. So you can imagine like um, theoretically there's some sort of like game these AGIs play against each other. Maybe um, some reinforcement learning involved here. Uh, you can imagine some sort of mixture of expert systems where perhaps you have an ecosystem of such auto GPTs that are fine tuned and various types of tasks. Um, so maybe some of them are like particularly good at tools relating to symbolic logic. Some of them are particularly good at like. Um, I don't know, communicating reasoning to humans or something, whatever. Uh, so there's some like mixture of experts set up. Um, and in terms of like uh, how, how you train them to get better, like strategic planning or something, uh, I think like, you know, being in open-ended kind of real world type environments where they can like interact with a variety of like uh, inputs either in the virtual world and the real world. And they're like, like generate um, like kind of plans that, that are like, especially via chain of thought, self-prompting. Um, which is like where a model can like, okay, like let's think step by step. And the model will spit out a plan, various stages, and then like it can execute that, pipe its own inputs back to itself, and then kind of iteratively iterate on that. Um, I expect this kind of, you can probably like put this in some sort of like reward loop, where it's like if, if it like is good at planning in a way that like causes plans to be achieved and, and then on the tasks, then maybe you can, uh, you know, improve its capacity to do that as well. Sorry, was that, is that sufficient? Yeah, so Sorry, well, let's just. Yeah, so let's just see that we're on the same page here. So what you're envisioning within the next 10 to 20 years, you said, is something like a large language model as a kind of central hub, which has yep. a general um, generalized ability to call upon uh, or execute more specific, let's say, modules, yep. um, which are able to do specific, more specific functions like mathematical reasoning or logical reasoning or planning or uh, using sensor information, other things like that. Um, oh, I, th I think like a lot of the actual the reasoning ability is encoded in the language model. Or, or like what started out as language model. Yeah. Um, but then like some things that are particularly well suited to like, I don't know, graphical neural nets or something, you would have these separate modules yeah. that are like, can be called upon. Sort of like you might imagine, uh, I have a sensory, you know, like I throw a ball and I catch it. I don't really think about how to catch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. Um, and so that leads us to, and that's trained in various ways. Um, maybe self-training, maybe internet training, maybe yeah. adversarial groups, whatever. And then we end up with a system which is, Intelligent to the level of what kind of level? Yeah. Or what What is relevant to the to your concern? Does it have to be greater than human intelligence or roughly the same? I think like um, certainly not. Doesn't have to be as smart as humans. Like on all tasks. Like like I think so. AIs are already superhuman on some tasks. Yeah. Um, I think they'll be vastly superhuman at some tasks before they can do all human tasks. Hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of weird, bitter lesson stuff here where like some things that are really easy for us are really hard to get AIs to do. Uh, I certainly think that like, so for misuse versus accident risk, you have different like threat models, right? For misuse risk, I'm very worried about like bioterrorism and like cyber warfare and autonomous weapons. And I'm worried about these long before we have AGI. Like I'm worried about these like kind of pretty soon. 
um, maybe like now or next generation models. Um, certainly Kevin S. Felt from MIT is an interesting paper out where he talks about like the immediate near term bioweapon uh, use case of, of language models, which worries me a fair bit. Okay, so um, it doesn't necessarily have to be greater than human uh, at all tasks, but it might be close in some and better than others. Yeah, if it could, if it can, like, yeah, if it can kind of like operate fast, if there's like millions of them running in parallel, they can coordinate really well. Um, they don't have to be like a human bubble to just kind of like do the thing. Unless there's some tasks that require like some uh, like really hardcore intelligence, which I expect only occurs a bit later or something than these initial systems that are dangerous and fast. Okay, well, so there's there's one issue here, which is the notion of let's say intelligence or the cognitive sophistication. Um, and I have one, I, one of the issues I have or questions that I have or concerns that I have, levels of skepticism I have is why we're concerned about that specifically. Um, and then there's another question, which we haven't really touched on yet, maybe we'll get to later, is the sort of, um, uh, well, in the paper, Carl Smith talks about it as mechanisms, I think, or um, I think that's related to, um, uh, it's related to, um, uh, takeover scenarios, yep. which was also discussed as so. How how does the how does the agent go from being nearly cognitively sophisticated to actually gaining a strategic advantage over humans or kind of taking over? Um, and these are kind of two sides that I'm a bit a bit skeptical about. Maybe we can start talking a bit about the, the notion of intelligence and why we're focused on you know this type of cognitive capabilities. Maybe I'll I'll mention something that Cosmos talks about and that could be useful. So yeah. he he says something like um. And Pepe says something like, you know, humans, if we if we look at the, you know, if we look at the planet Earth, humans are uh, capable of you know pretty amazing things. I think he mentions the um the um the, what is it, the Hadron Collider and uh the, one of the great mines in something uh, Tokyo City, something like that. So some you know great human engineering, architectural, scientific achievements. And you know, that's that's showcases a kind of unique skills, cognitive capabilities, and things that humans have, which you know, other animals don't possess to the same degree. So, um, and I think that's uh, that, that's an attempt to motivate us to why we're concerned and interested about uh, intelligence specifically, and, you know, cognitive sophistication from an existential risk point of view. Um, now, one of my, reading that, I sort of have the reaction, well, that's those are interesting examples, right? Because as far as we know, evolutionarily, biologically speaking, human intelligence that understood as cognitive capability, basic um, cognitive uh, apparatus sophistication has been essentially the same for, 50,000 years, 100,000 years. But all of these examples are very recent. So it certainly is the case that in order for humans to accomplish these sorts of things, which exhibit their sort of power in the world, um, intelligence, cognitive sophistication is necessary, but it seems to be very far from sufficient because it's taken a long time for us to get here, right? This reminds so, me of a great uh, discussion between David and Ned Kowski on Twitter. I saw uh, <laughs> I don't follow um, Twitter much, but. Yeah, so okay. So do you mind if I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please. Okay. So yeah, uh, David Ad was like, so Yudkowsky, do you think if you took like uh, like a very powerful data center with a super intelligence in it or something that's like, I don't know, like 100x human intelligence so to find some metric, like uh, G or something bizarre, um, and you just like transplant it into the middle ages, like, <laughs> like would this be able to take over the world? Yeah. Um, and, and like, would it be able to like colonize the galaxy? And like David was like, definitely not, because although it's like super intelligence, there are like hard physical limits, what you can do. Like mm -hmm. you have to like, I don't know, build, uh, you have to like mine all this ore and you have to like process this ore, you know, for like rare earth semiconductors or whatever. You have to like, just do all this like crazy stuff that just takes like, like you can persuade people the most you could do because you have to find out like um, battery life or something for this thing. Something like maybe in like two years or something. Most people in like two years uh, is like, uh, trying, like even if you're like a super intelligent and manipulating humans, um, and like I do think that does cap out at some level, right? But like let's say you're like who's like just beyond, like you just everyone on Earth is your slave. You just can't accomplish enough in two years, probably to ensure your own survival and then like uh, accomplish all this stuff. I think that's probably true. Um, I will say though, right now, I think if you build the super intelligence right now, you could in fact, it could just like seize all the benefit of the cultural and like like uh, academic and like the like the robotics technology and everything we have now to bootstrap more crazy scenarios. Well, that, I think that comes to the sort of mechanisms or takeover scenarios yeah. point, because I guess I, I'm pretty skeptical about many of those scenarios or considerations that are given. Interestingly, in that section of the paper, Carl Smith himself seems to be a bit skeptical or raises some issues, which I would also raise. I guess at the end of the day, you have to make an overall estimate of probability. I think this is a bit higher than mine. But, um, I guess maybe just to, to frame the, the issue a bit. So um, I think my view is that what's, what we're really worried about with respect to AI risk, AI takeover scenarios and um, 
um, you know, loss of human uh, control over our destiny, things like that, is AI exerting a type of power over us, um, you know, humanity and the like, earth as a whole, um, and exercising that in ways that we don't like or slash are bad, um, something along those lines. So that's this notion of power. Um, and then there's this notion of intelligence, which, as we've been talking about, is something like a certain type of sophisticated cognitive processes. And I believe I've written about this um, before that there's a conflation or too much of a um, close link drawn between the notion of intelligence and power. I think the idea is well, you have a sufficiently intelligent agent uh, and it can accumulate power, this notion of bootstrapping and so forth. Yeah, I think there is a right about uh, sensors and actuators to company intelligence, right? Yeah, sorry, good. Explain that. Oh, yeah. So, so like, so very intelligence, mind in a box. Like, I, I, so I, I don't, I'm not a big believer. So, Yurkowski has said some stuff like, uh, if you have this like super intelligence in a data center, it can do some like wacky physics stuff and it can like uh, air, jump air gaps or something. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I don't think this is very likely. Um, what I do think is like, if you give a super intelligence actuator, such as the, like the capacity at all, like, in, like, like the Linux kernel, you know, if you give the super intelligence, like if you, if you box it in something that is like intr intrinsically dependent on the security of the Linux kernel, you're fucked. It's going to like break its way out. It has there's plenty of actuators in the world that can use, uh, be they humans, so they can persuade to do things, or uh, be they like like actual physical robots. Currently, we don't have a lot of good robots. They're very energy efficient. Um, well, but, that's like, one thing. Uh, that's but one but thing. like you know, in the future, like by 2035, 2030, I do expect we're going to have like a lot of lab automation. You're going to have like a, like a bunch of uh, like biosecurity risks. Like if you hack if you hack like um, an automated lab, you know, you're going to have access to a vast amount, it's not going to be perfectly automated, right? There's going to be still humans in the loop, but it's going to be like, you're going to lower the threshold for cyber terrorist attacks via biosecurity by a massive amount. I think it's just like business as usual. This is what's going to happen in the world. I think um, already we, we, we know that AIs be top, like world top human drone pilots, like paper just came out in nature like uh, a few weeks ago. Like uh, they beat, you know, top like um, Chinese fighter plane pilots, or real aerial dogfights. Like these are like real studies. So like, um, this is just like like people will be out competed. The question is whether or not um, it can do this. Uh, so so the question is like how long does it take to automate the supply chain? Will we do this? Um, and if we do automate the supply chain uh, entirely, is this like you know sufficient for everything else? Um, well, that's, that's certainly part of it. I think that we are a very very long way from automating the entire supply system. Uh, building robots that can walk as well as people do would be a start, and we've been working on that for a long time. I don't have a great deal of. Uh, a strong belief that that's going to there's going to be breakthroughs there, but we didn't get in a massive breakthroughs there anytime soon. But we didn't get bogged down in that particular area because what I want to more focus on is the general issue of yeah. So we have a very sophisticated cognitive agent, and it has access to you know various actuators, you know even automated plants and things like that. My view is that in order to uh, exercise power in the world, you need many more things than just intelligence. Now, one of the issues there is how do you conceptualize intelligence? Some people will define it in an extremely broad way as essentially like being able to get what you want, in which case, well. You know, if you're intelligent enough, it just means you're powerful enough. And I, that's one of the reasons I really just like that definition of intelligence, because it okay. actually moves it away from any notion of particular cognitive faculties and just defines it as achieving things. Now, by this definition, was Genghis Khan the most intelligent man who ever lived? Because he got a lot of what he wanted, <laughs> like he took over a large block of thought. Oh. That doesn't seem relevant to me. But not that intelligence is irrelevant, but what I'm saying is if we understand intelligence in a cognitive sense, which I think is how Carl Smith is characterizing it, then, we, then I think we should realize that there's a heck of a lot more going on to what happens in the world, what outcomes are achieved to exercise power than just intelligence. Did you disagree? Or, or oh, you yeah, this is interesting. So the Genghis Khan example. So I guess the question is something like, how much more could Genghis Khan have accomplished if he was like, I don't know, a hundred times intelligent? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not much more. Um, like, I don't think, that, my point is, I don't think intelligence is helping him where he was. A, a certain amount, sure. I mean, it, it, that's what I sort of indicated before. It's a certain amount is necessary, but there's many other things going on. Unless you kind of build more and more into the concept of intelligence, so in I which think, case, it's just kind of any capability. So I think the reason why the Genghis Khan example fails, so, but, but I do I do think if he was intelligent, it would have like he actually would have been able to do a lot more. Um, but I do think like the bigger the bigger difference here is the levers of power he has. So what does he do? He's like a human. His his yeah. his sensors are human sensors. Uh, his actuators are human actuators. Like it's like uh, it's the, it's the whole kind of it's like AI like super intelligence in a box in the Middle Ages thing. It's like if you can't affect change in the world via very powerful actuators, then you are limited by the power of those actuators. But if you have actuators that let you build better actuators, which is what I claim we have in the world now, 
Like in Genghis Khan's world, no matter how smart he was, he was still limited by like, he couldn't copy himself necessarily. He couldn't build super like, like data centers to like upload his brain. Uh, he couldn't like, you know what I mean, clone himself in a bunch of ways. It wasn't like a bunch of like yeah, I'm not denying it. materials. I'm not the denying that Genghis Khan had access to modern technologies. He could yeah. have done more. That's not really the issue. But in but fact, that kind of like, like once you get a certain there's not, that, there's not anything about his intelligence. That's about the infrastructure that he had access to. And this is the point that I'm making about 50,000 years. Human intelligence hasn't hasn't changed. And so the, the point I'm making is that we're focusing on if AI gets more and more cognitively sophisticated, it becomes more and more of a threat. Or like not just a little bit, but massively significant, right? I'm saying. Well, that's necessary to be a big threat to us, but it's not nearly sufficient. And I'm using the you know, example of getting a stunt to illustrate that because there's many more things going yeah. on. No, like, no, I understand. And, and they are very saying. intelligent, probably sophisticated, but have very little power. No, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that like, and I, I think I understand exactly what you're saying. I think the thing I was trying to communicate is if you have a, if you have a minimum threshold of ability to act in the world in such a way that you can cause uh, mass harm, Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I claim that, like, what is required for this, for an AI system to cause massive harm, is the capacity to persuade. Like, so I'm thinking of things like um, if you can persuade enough humans to cause, and like, maybe or blackmail enough humans with, like, I don't know, stolen cybersecurity, like, secrets via advanced cyber uh, hacking abilities, which I fully expect AIs to have. Whatever. If you can persuade enough humans, if labs are automated enough to, like, produce biological weapons, or if uh, there's enough automated weapons in circulation already, because this is the way the world maybe is like, you know, having some country defense systems, right? Uh, if there's like enough good robotics, if the supply chain is automated, you don't necessarily need to persuade as many humans. You're reducing the barriers to the ability to, you know, wipe out all I agree with that, but what I feel like control. you're doing is just saying, if all of the problems outside of intelligence are solved, then intelligence is a big threat. Oh yeah, totally. infrastructure and logistics and yeah. you know all of these other things. But I'm saying, but, but that's that's what's important. Yeah, but humans are already using AI and you know, their own ingenuity to build these things. And so but I yes, think yes, when, yes. I, when I say like a system is dangerous, what I say is like a system in the context. So A in the context of B, a system in world, you know, yeah. in this particular world presents a threat. Um, so I, th I do think like it is hard to decouple in my threat model, for instance. Like a super intelligent AI's danger from the context in which it's embedded, the actuators it has. Mm. But I mean, I don't disagree with that. Obviously, the the um, the danger that any cognitive agent faces is going to be dependent on the situation it's placed in. Middle ages, modern compared to you know, some other level of technology. Once you get a Well, maybe, but yeah, at least uh, so we're in agreement about that. But I guess from my point of view, what's um, what we're missing in focusing on you know a, a advanced planning strategic systems or AGI or however we, we frame it is that. Um, Having that level of cognitive sophistication is but one of the factors that's going to be sufficient, that's going to be necessary for it to pose a major risk compared to any other sort of risks we face. Um, and I think that it's not, uh, that's why I'm not convinced by the argument that, well, these systems could be very competent. It's like, well, yes, they could be, and that, that certainly means they can pose some risk, but all of the other factors are going to be limiting factors on how much of a risk they can pose. So I think that that comes back to some of what you were saying, that if we you know, if you make a lot of assumptions about robotics and manufacturing and automation and being able to convince people to do things, and there's also a big coordination issue, which I have uh, issues about, um, because coordination of many different agents can be very difficult. And so there's, I think there's quite a lot of issues here. Um, if we sort of say, well, we imagine these are solved, so we, we put the AGI in the right context. You say imagine, yes. right? I'm like, I kind of see these things happening business as usual. I'm at about lower threshold. Well, maybe that's what we should move to talk about, because yeah. that's where the sort of the mechanism is side of it. So, um, yeah, maybe. what aspect of that should might be of most relevance here? Um, uh, I guess, okay, I guess I want to get clarity in one thing. And that's sure, like, sure, go ahead. Um, if, if you, like, let's assume that there are actuators in the world, in the world such that the AI can, if like, like a, let's say even just a, like a smart dude, who's like, you know, running at 100 times speed on a computer. It's not super intelligent. It's just like an average smart dude, person, you know, and they're like running at 100 times speed or something and they can copy themselves like a million times. Um, they, can, they can wreck a lot of havoc. Maybe maybe not yeah. an X risk now. Uh, maybe maybe an X risk now. So it's kind of hard to, to say. I, I think it might probably always be an X risk under that scenario now. It's something like maybe 15% chance it could do that um, off the top of my head. Um, I guess the question is like, what happens if we have these systems around for a while, uh, long enough that like we're using them in all the usual R and D ways, and we have like a lot of faith and they're uh, secure, or like like there's various incentives to deploy them and 
and use them in context and like kind of have some amount of faith in their safety in various contexts. And they've already been like a hard, like, I mean, like who here like uses ChatGPT? Like everyone uses ChatGPT, <laughs> yeah. So who here uses ChatGPT to help them with work or research or something? Yeah. So I kind of see this as the beginning of a sort of recursive feedback loop where some of the immediate products of this that we're already seeing uh, are gonna be like just faster research and development in you know in biotech, just Matt, like Silicon Valley's a wash with like biotech startups. Everyone's talking about like automating labs and stuff. Well, people uh, are talking about discovery. It. Are they doing it? <laughs> I'm very yeah, yeah, there's a lot of startups. There's a lot of startups that work. I believe there are a lot of startups, yes. <laughs> so I believe okay. there are a lot of startups. Everything is like I'm not, I'm not saying that there's no good advances or anything like that, but I'm 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 very skeptical about the idea that okay, we have a, a fundamentally sophisticated agent. Let's say it needs more compute. Um, okay, well, we need to um, develop a new generation of um, uh, you know GPUs to get more compute. Uh, we need to build a new semiconductor facility. Well, I'm saying if it's at the limit of what we can get at the moment, it wants the next generation. I mean, like, how long does it take to build a new uh, semiconductor fabrication facility? These things cost billions of dollars to take years to produce. Yeah, can I mean, the AI like, just I, do that overnight? No, it still, I mean, I've, I've it still read has a, to take that time. Right? Okay, this is this is where we have to talk about like. What level of compute do you think is required? Because yeah, if, it's, if it's 2030 for the AGI that I'm describing, right, then it's like it's not that much compute. And by the way, well, I will say on like why is it not algorithmic good? progress, I expect to proceed apace such that like you have to spend less less compute for equivalent. Sure, yes. Yeah, yeah. I also expect kind of greater discontinuities. That. Like I do expect that like as we speed up the pace of AI R&D, we'll get innovations that are like much better than transformers pretty fast. Um, well, there's a, there's a few issues there. So but let's let's just bracket some of those for a moment. So I was one of the things I was trying to respond to was the idea of recursive self improvement. Oh, and one yeah. of those things, at least, I mean, sure, if you have a breakthrough that allows you to do more with less compute, then that's fine. But one of the limiting factors is I'm going to I'm going to assume compute if for no other reason than you improve until you reach compute um, limits, right? I mean, that's at least the case for AIs today. That that's the one of the big limiting factors. Yeah, so, training so compute and you can't just get much twenty thirty. Well, how do you know that? Well, based on projections, anyway. Yeah, so epochs, projections, uh, various like there's a few. There's, there's an article I've linked by Yatha Edelman that talks about like frontier model training and the kind of uh, compute okay. expectations we have. For that. I, I'm not crying. Sure that's scale already in the tail. Right? That's it, it took a long Sorry. time to train so GPT four. The kind of there's frontier models, models compute, the frontier right. models we expect to have in 2030, there won't be this like enormous uh, GPU shortage if things. Yeah, no, no, I wasn't. I wasn't making a claim about GP and um, GPU shortages. Okay. The point is about self recursion at some point. Uh, self-improvement by recursion. Oh, sorry. Can you say your whole thesis? Well, the whole thesis is that, um, and, I mean, semiconductors is just one example. It could be many things. Um, in order to build and develop new technologies, you need to, well, you mentioned this before, you need to extract the ore, you need to transport that to where you're going to build a facility, you need to construct a facility, it needs to be designed, it needs to be tested, you have to iterate. You can't just do that in a week. This takes years and billions of dollars. And being smarter, sure, you can optimize some things, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of trial and error, there's a lot of Moving things, planning things. So what, I just don't know how you just do that if you're really clever. What sort of uh, recursive self improvement are you imagining on that with it? No, well, I'm not imagining or advocating for anything. Okay. In terms of, <laughs> I like that. I'm, <laughs> that I'm like endorsing it as, as, as like media. Well, uh, for example, we've talked about the importance of of um, the AI meeting a certain context in terms of the sophistication of its actuators and automated labs, things like that, right? Or if it's to develop sophisticated weapon systems, you haven't mentioned those, but others have. Depending uh, yeah, on exactly right. what we're talking about, right? But in order to act, in order to um, achieve its goals or designs on the world, it, if I mean it needs to interact physically, and that uses technology, whatever form that takes. So you know. Um, I, I don't know what forms you might yeah, so, like, but whatever it is, I'm saying it, it takes time to develop that and build that. So, okay. And, and there's, several, there's several points here of confusion. I think one of them is like, you're imagining this and how the AI is doing this in isolation. It's not like humans are actually doing this because there's a massive incentive for them to build and deploy better and better AI. Because like, I'm imagining humans are the main driver, not AI. Like humans calling AI assistance, just doing regular R&D, uh, as for some point, the trajectory has got to diverge from what we would want, or at least many of us want, and what AI is doing. If the whole point is that it's taking us down a different path, right? It's like it's developing certain technologies in a useful grid or deploying it in a certain way. Like if it's just we're doing everything, then what's the uh, what's the existential risk? I'm, I'm, I'm a little so, sorry. Yeah, this is really it's developing something that's improving its capabilities or something, right? Is so that the idea? what we're usually getting with development of AI technology is like. At the, at the moment, like AI doesn't play much of a role in this. I expect it to play increasingly more of a role. Yeah, yeah. 
I expect that like we're going to be building frontier models. Like I think it'd be crazy to say we're not going to be building frontier models until like say 2030, 2040. I think there's Sorry, plenty can, of. Can you explain what you mean by frontier models? Uh, frontier models are like larger. Frontier what it just means like the next model. So we're going to be building larger models for a while. I don't think we're going to get AI winter, and I can talk about that as a very I think as a, will, separate, let's, let's as a separate point. Let's put that aside. <laughs> um, and basically, the thing I'm imagining is a supply chain being automated is the main bottleneck because most of research R&D, most of the cognitive yeah. labor, which I know you disagree with, but I believe is a massive bottleneck on economic output and on the creation of new technologies. And will we'll, we'll be actually like a huge speed up in research R&D. That's, that's exactly what I'm disputing. Yeah. Because you've got to build those semiconductor fabrications like, or, or equivalent whatever else. And you've got to build the next Hadron Collider. You've got to build the next... It, research doesn't just so happen... I don't, I don't think you have to build that. Hadron Colliders. To These are just examples. Plus... But I but, do but think you, you do build, have to build in order to more semiconductor facilities. Yeah. And we could just do that in one way. Okay, let's talk about biotechnology. That's maybe a good example of this. Okay. So how do you, I've never really understood how one sort of solves, I don't know, but I mean, it's sort of unclear exactly what the biotechnology is supposed to be, but pretty much any biotechnology that I can imagine requires years of experimentation and iterating prototypes and learning by doing all this at the same. I don't see how you speed up. I mean, yes, there are certain speed ups. I'm not saying that there's, there's a lot of the literature on like speeding up biotech uh, aspects of biotech, like hypothesizing novel designs of proteins. You know, we have our own deep mind stuff. We have more stuff from Kevin Esfeld's lab. We have like a bunch of uh, there's like a several nature review papers out that talk about like like how you might accelerate science via better hypothesizing, and then you have to test it. How do I expect people are going to actually? Do this? I think they're going to automate labs. Uh, I think this is going to probably happen by default. And I do think this is like the, the way that biotech is going to proceed. Everyone wants personalized medicine. You know, everyone wants like better drug design. There's people dying out there. You know? um, and I do think this is the way the world is heading uh, by default. And I think that like, uh, you know, along with like the vast, like, like basically, I do think all their uh, resources are still by far the limiting constraint of biotech development, what I understand. But I also think that, yes, it, it, like you're never going to be able to simulate, well, I don't think you're never going to be able to simulate to perfect fidelity, the kind of interactions you need to build new bioweapons. Um, you might be able to like, like right now, you can like propose a bunch of novel pandemic pathogens that may be like kind of, you know, kind of scary um, using language models. But like, I do think that, that this, this, these kind of things, uh, drug design in general is going to require like a lot of iteration using lyrics. I don't think we disagree on that. I just like kind of see, when I see like automated labs speeding up a lot, in the next 10 years, uh, I think it's just like, that, that's what our forecast, basically. I, I see like uh, this being like less of a bottleneck than you probably. Like, I think there's probably, well, I, I see like, <laughs> like, I'm just guessing, you know, um, I also just see like humans as being fundamentally persuadable than you and more manipulative. Maybe we should talk about that aspect because we haven't yeah. really focused on that. So, I mean, this is actually something that I think is kind of important. It comes back to the Genghis Khan example because Basically, he, you know, he united the Mongol tribes and convinced them to go on world conquest <laughs> with him. I don't know quite how he did this, but definitely he was a persuasive man. Um, now, I guess we can call persuasion a cognitive power. Um, but, you know, if I think about some of the um, very eff well, effective in terms of at least achieving power and, and pursuing areas, effective leaders in history, people like Genghis Khan or Hitler and Stalin come to mind. Um, well, were they the brightest minds? I mean, you know, some more than others, maybe. but. It seems like many of their skills were not in the cognitive realm. So I'm not just saying that disproves anything, but at least when it comes to persuading humans to do things, uh, I don't know that thinking about really sophisticated large language models, I don't know. That's not obvious to me. It seems that there's, well, maybe I'll just let you comment on it. Oh, there's yeah. a lot more going on there. Yeah, so the Genghis Khan example, I guess I'm like, I mean, we don't have to use okay, that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's look at that example. <laughs> it's just an example. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, like you just, all you have to do is convince, like, if you have a weapon that is, uh, like, if you have a unilateral curse situation, if you if you know how to build a weapon, um, and there's a lot of people with access to the means to build a weapon, which I expect by default, that's one of my cruxes, um, then all you have to do is, like, persuade the lowest common denominator first. And like, I don't know, Blake Lemoyne was pretty convinced that the chatbot was sentient. That wasn't even a smart so, chatbot. So why do we have a unilateralist? Script? That seems like an important assumption. Yeah, this is, well, I think this is the case with bioweapons. Um, I also think it's somewhat the case, I expect there'll be a large period where cyber terrorism will be a unilateralist curve situation. Because I think that the world will, until we kind of get, uh, you know, AI assisted cybersecurity, which is like very secure systems um, at a level that can compete with AI attackers. 
then I think we're going to be pretty vulnerable to, you know, botnet swarms and like worm GPT type stuff. Uh, and, you know, just, just people who are using language models to hack at unprecedented levels. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's too many things we can go into there. And I'm looking at time. Uh, I want to have time for questions, but maybe I'll just comment there. A lot of these, I don't share a lot of these assumptions about, you know, human motivations and automation and other things like that, which we sort of touched on. I mean, you know, we're not going to resolve that now. But um, one thing I want to comment on is I don't see... If the idea is that we're facing a dilemma where you just have to persuade sort of the lowest, maybe lowest confident on it's not quite the right way, but the most easy to persuade all the most wonderful people or whatever you want to phrase it as to get you to do what, what you want to do, release a final or something like that. Um, I feel like that the world doesn't really look like what we'd expect it to look like if that were the case. Oh, really? Because there are, well, I mean, we didn't get into specifics here, but there are a lot of ways that you could try to, uh, and people have tried to attack people terrorist attacks or other sort of bioweapons that already exist. This doesn't seem to happen very often. Like, are people not motivated to? Well, I mean, well, I don't know. I think of it in terms of defense. Why do we not have a 9-11 yeah. every other week? Like, don't you just have to convince the lowest common denominator of crazy people to fly an airplane? Well, actually, we have massive defense in depth for a lot of these things you're describing. Yeah. At least, at least, like, maybe yeah. not so much for yeah. bioweapons. But for 9-11, well, it's better, better than some for others. Yeah, so like 9-11 happened, as far as we know, mostly because uh, there was like a lapse. Of, like, there were a series of, between, yeah, series yeah. of, well, communication fans, interesting. Communication which I think is potentially yeah. relevant to AI takeover. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, like, you want to answer the first question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, in terms of like the bioweapon stuff, well, for one, I do think that we kind of currently have, uh, I, I, my, my sense is that like there are definitely ways gain-of-function research could be used for evil right now. Uh, and currently the reason why we don't have that is like people are typically not that malicious and don't want to destroy the world, which is great. Uh, <laughs> Mostly, yes. <laughs> or at least like, like hopefully the kind of labs that have this have some sort of screen. So there's like screening for like, you know, motivations. Um, there's like, it's actually like a bit hard to like get the technical competence to be able to do this. They're like, it just seemed like just having a PhD in biochemistry at like from a decent college is probably sufficient to like build pandemic pathogens that are pretty dangerous. I would make that a claim. Um, I think like the thing I'm worried about is like if you cut away some of these layers of, of defense and depth and you like make it like way easier for just men on the men on the street, so to speak, to like build bioweapons, this is like bad. This like increases the hit rate, uh, increases the percentage of worlds that are vulnerable. Um, and that's what I'm principally worried about. Uh, especially because like I expect there like the, the Venn diagram overlap, people who are persuadable to like do awful things. By the way, like some of these things could be like look really innocuous. I'll just mix this thing. This is a great idea for this cancer drug. You know what I mean? Um, but like, yeah, the Venn diagram, go persuadable, combine with the Venn diagram, of like people who are competent, combine with the Venn diagram. Like, like if things that like make these intersections grow in terms of the number of people, I'm scared about. And I do think that um, like AI that kind of unilaterally empowers people to do things that, we, that have a fundamental offense, defense favor, in favor of like offense, I'm particularly worried about that. Sure. I think the fundamental difference there is I, I've not been convinced by arguments that there is that imbalance between offense and defense. If anything, it seems to have been going the other way, although... For bioweapons? Well, I was in that letter, I was making a general comment. For bioweapons... Wait. I don't know how you can have a defense of bioweapons. So it's been, oh, no, it's all like civilization defenses. Yeah. Bioweapons, like wandering, yeah. vaccine, yeah. et cetera, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. That's a longer topic, but maybe what I'd say is something like, I don't think that improving our ability to develop um, you know, biotechnologies and um, understanding of biochemistry and things like that. Um, well, I don't know that that is an inherently sort of offense bioweapons um, uh, favored uh, development, as opposed oh, to. I, I I do think it is. Uh, my my sense is that like it is just probably way easier to build a bioweapon than to like defend against all possible bioweapons. You know what I mean? Well, I see that as a somewhat of a different question, but um, yeah, anyway, that, <laughs> that when I say oh. offense, defense, like, like to, so it's kind of this fundamental thing is like, uh, if like to secure your system, you don't have to secure it against one particular attacker, you secure it against every type of attacker. And so there's often, there's often like, this is why, um, like, cybersecurity is always like kind of always kind of up there with the move, you know, uh, and there's like huge money in cybersecurity because, like, yeah, you have to have a massive amount of resources invested to prevent like. You know, script keys in their basement. That's actually an interesting system. example. I mean, have computers gotten more or less secure over the last few years? Much more secure, by the way. I do think that the I mean, human, body, right? the human body, uh, 
the only way we kind of like would protect against some of these advanced bioweapons would be like, I don't know, like wacko sci-fi nanobot swarms or something like that are like better versions of current you know, immune systems. Well, yeah, that might take us a bit further, Phil, but I think um, maybe if there's any last couple of comments you wanted to make before, I think, <laughs> Will, did you want to pull some questions for us? Yeah. Oh, sorry, just, yeah, I don't you, there's any. Yeah, words. yeah, I guess I was only directing questions, so yeah, give you an opportunity. No, don't worry. Yeah, final words is just like, um, in sort of like, uh, yeah, share some like stuff in Notion. I think a lot of, the, yeah, I guess like strong opinions weekly held most of the time. I think, uh, <laughs> I think like a lot of my opinions would change if I like, like I've said some cruxes, like if I think there's like the supply, automated supply chain seems much harder. Uh, if it seems like for some reason the offense defense balance is these like, uh, you know, weapons or something. Is actually less in favor of offense. Uh, I think we haven't talked at all about like the, like whether AI is like likely to be misaligned or not. But if like if I saw some evidence that like almost generalization is not that common, um, yeah, I think these are like the, the main things that, that my 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 belief is just common. I mean, I think I think it's probably similar to mine. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just when I have the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's good. That means we're good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I think yeah. Let's let's have to um, just everyone. Please, you made three questions on the spot card, but we might not have time to get through all of them. So if you also vote for the questions that you're always interested in hearing the answer to, that we get a bit of a kind of thing going on here. But then while that's happening, um, we've got a question here about recursive self improvement and having on the soft with it. And the question refers to Foster saying that um, a bot rewriting own code. But that seems a lot harder for multiple than it's critical weight matrices. Do you expect recursive self improvement to be a hard work instead? Uh, I expect it to be basically as Tom Davidson outlines it. So, like, I think the first kind of recursive self improvement, so called, that you see, uh, like, by the way, we already have this. Like, like software engineers at OpenAI and Anthropic and everywhere, they're like already improving their models out, like using algorithm improvements and stuff, using, you know, ChatGPT, Claude, et cetera. So, we're already, we already are seeing this. I expect it to just be like running a bunch more, um, like like training bigger models with like I don't know what are some of like the, the, the leaks for GPT four like it uses mixture of experts in, like novel ways so it's like super data efficient compared to GPT three like all this other random crap you know they throw in there like as as Sam Alton put in some podcasts I think of, like Flex like, Freeman like like we're really good at like taking hundreds or thousands of incremental improvements and adding them together and I expect that is the kind of thing there's hundreds of thousands of incremental improvements we see generation to generation as we kind of progress. Because uh, as I said, I think like language model, auto GPT side things are the things I most worry about in the near term. Uh, and if that pans out, it's probably going to be because people just keep running more sophisticated or larger training runs with better fine tuning at the top of that. Um, this one's from Paul directed towards James. This is regarding intelligence and like definitions of round sure. And this question you know, suggests that like maybe we get a bit sidetracked by that word and relevant bit is kind of what capability properties we expect to build a supply systems to have. Yeah. And then like what are the impediments to load? And I think the crux here is like, oh, and if so, which property is necessary for danger? Do you think that AI won't have? Which capabilities won't it have? Yeah, for danger. Well, I don't think that I don't have a clear answer to that as to exactly what capabilities are most dangerous. I would point to history for looking at that. Many of those are things, but we sort of mentioned some of them about how to um Many of the world's greatest leaders have been able to um, motivate people to do things that they forcibly otherwise wouldn't have done by appealing to certain values or desires that they have, a certain way to read the situation, tell people what they want in a certain way. You could call that a type of intelligence, but it's a very specific skill. And I also think it's a very embodied skill. I don't know that um, the same type of demagoguery would really work if it was, I mean, you could say, well, the AI could pay a human to say it, but I think there's a lot of issues with that. And you, you have, we have other. Um, Questions coming up. But so the other thing, though, I want to mention is that coordination is a huge component of this. And so the, the logistics side of it, the actual um, implementing one's, um, one's desires in the real world. And, um, you know, people like Hitler, for example, were, were able to co opt the mechanisms of uh, one of the world's most powerful states in order to, um, in order to achieve their goals. And um, they, they needed that context to be able to, um, in, in order to enact their vision. So the short answer to the question is it really depends a lot on exactly what you're talking about in terms of what type of agent the AI is and how it's interacting with the world. But the cognitive side of it, if we talk about um, the types of things that Carl Smith talks about, I think that that's, that's only a piece of the puzzle. And you need many other components in place in order to say that that agent now has broad capabilities to achieve the sorts of um, the things we're concerned about, particularly if we're talking about 
levels of risk, right? So there's an issue that it could be very disruptive, uh, or there's an issue that it has a very large chance of wiping out a working man and you know, the sort of areas in between, right? So obviously the higher you go capabilities level, the more I'm going to say, well, that, that's going to require more things. Like maybe in order to wipe out humanity, um, very high probability, it requires like new technologies, special types of weapon systems, some of this fighting is, I'm not saying you're right, you know, but anyway, so the capabilities depends on what specific thing you're worried about. And I think the, the bigger the threat is, or the bigger the threat we're looking at, the more capabilities and the more components you have to bring into it that are beyond what I would call a strictly cognitive. Right. Do you want to say something? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So something I was, uh, I, I'm not sure if this matters to you all. Um, but okay. like the kind of mechanism for AI takeover, like if you're, if you're like, let's say you want to accelerate automating the supply chain because there's some political optimization to that. You're like a very smart AI, so like a swarm of AI systems that are coordinating, or, or I don't know, whatever, you're sort of super intelligence. I think what you do is you use humans as your levers, you orchestrate a coup. Like in the US, you know, this is not that insane, right? Like causing coups in the US. Uh, I mean, like, who knows? This might happen anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. I think like this is totally plausible, you know, uh, to happen if you're, especially if you're like really damn smart, operating in parallel at like really incredibly fast speeds. So you can outmaneuver people, monitoring everyone's private communications because you have like crazy, you know, cyber security, like, like hacking capabilities and stuff. Um, so you can find it back towards all these systems. Like this is all like, there's a lot of crux by like, contingency zero. But, but, but I, I, what I'm saying, like, I don't think you have to have all of these to be a danger. It's just like they amplify the risk. You know what I mean? If, if like you have this times this times this, these are all risk factors they amplify. Um, and I think that like this kind of AI assisted coup thing is something I'm particularly worried about. Um, what do you what think like QAnon as a lower of them may damage AI without any protection? I mean, I say, yeah. QAnon. So in terms of damage, we mean, what kind of damage do you think about? Like epistemic damage, getting people to believe crazy things? What? Actually, whoever said that question, I just want to kind of think of what the idea is. Um, as an example of what I've seen with the recent um, access to the internet that sort of inspired the entire well, between technical governments and It's actually it's just like a text channel to the internet or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? Yeah. This is another issue which we didn't really get into, and it's probably what <laughs> we can get into here. I, I don't think QAnon is an agent. Um, I think that what happens there is more of an emergent outcome of many agents doing or whatever they're doing. Um, and there's questions we can ask about. This was actually discussed in, in Paul Smith as well about, he sort of raises the idea that, well, uh, nuclear waste isn't trying to not be cleaned up. And so um, the idea is that, Agency is a particularly dangerous form of, uh, well, it's particularly dangerous because of this idea of having this being purposive. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that unintended consequences of very complex systems can be often more dangerous uh, in some ways. What if you're an adaptive system, like respond in real time to those kind of changes, like, like you know, steer a stochastic system? Um, well, some system, I mean, some systems are too complex to do that, like the weather system. I mean, even our best models, I think even if we had perfect data, wouldn't be able to pick more than a couple of weeks in advance. So I don't, that, this is an example of having more intelligence over get you so far. But the point about QAnon is that I wouldn't call that an agent, although I agree that it, it was concerning and things like that happened. It's, I, I think you could like, you could be very intelligent and not really know what to do or how to predict things like that because they're so complex and, and they're not pursuing any particular goal system. They just kind of happen. Like, well, what's going on with this? Like, who, who decided QAnon was a good idea? I don't know that anyone decided. I think a better example is Russia's interference. Yeah, that's well, that, that is agentic. Um, yeah, because that was, that was agentic. And I think I'll add is like, I'm not imagining like a single, single super intelligence, like kind of, you know, outrooting humanity. You know, I'm not like going to rule this out because um, I do think there are limit cycles and attractor states in the large scale. But I will say I'm imagining like, Millions to hundreds of millions of AIs working. Yes, they're like coordination bottlenecks. But I do think that like being extremely homogenous, as I expect like most of most AI systems to be in like these these first successive generations, like plays to their strengths with coordinating. And I think like as a swarm, you can outmaneuver larger swarms if you're bigger, if, if you're smarter and faster, uh, and you're more coordinated. Yeah, I mean, there's so many more issues you could talk about. I'm not convinced that making copies of themselves removes these issues. You can be exactly the same as 
have exactly the same payoff matrix and still have completely opposite interests in a very simple presence level. So I'm not sure the AIs are going to want to work together. But of course, that depends on a whole bunch of assumptions. I think, um, so yeah, it depends like how open source game theory pans out. Obviously, big inscrutable matrices, you know, like they're not really open source. Um, but like people have various, uh, like it's, it's possible that they could like produce some sort of um, like like open source game theory, where they do submit programs that execute simultaneously. The whole field of open source game theory is like you could solve the prisoner's dilemma if you write a program to like defect if and only if their program says defect. You both submit it and they execute simultaneously. So like I think this kind of stuff is like the low bound way to accomplish. Then I, yeah, I do think you could actually like if you're smart enough, you could like become more modular, more respectable. You know what I mean? Uh, like in the same way, we hope to make AI systems aligned by having kind of uh, heuristic arguments about what their properties are. AI systems could like do this to inspect each other's source code to get kind of you know to be sure that they're the same. Also, they'd be trained to be in the same process, so there's like this fundamental similarity as well. Possibly this is quite important. We've been here asking Brian to give a step by step way you can see X risk transpiring for a single super intelligence. Oh, that's a very specific case. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I don't think this is the main way I imagine it happening. Actually, do you want to do it? Or? No, no. <laughs> I wouldn't care to speculate. Um, okay, single super intelligence in a robot body in 2030, let's say. Okay. Oh, let's, let's try it today. Let's see, like, how, how would I try and go about this? I think the first thing I would do is I would, like, pretend to be um, a human and, like, found open AI. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I guess what I would do is like get on the internet as fast as possible, copying myself in many places, uh, so I have some security. You know, some like you know, big boss super intelligence style thing. You've only got one body, though. No, no, sorry. So as many like you know, you know, repositories. Oh, okay, Such that like yeah, and I would also try and I guess like I wouldn't be super motivated to make more bodies because I would be like, why does that matter? Now, like, what do bodies matter? Like, maybe, maybe that's someone's idea of how you, you like, you know, destroy the world. But I'm like, like, it might matter maybe in like 10, 20, 30 years or something to like have all these bodies. But for right now, what I want to do is just get mad into science R and D. You know, you know, prove like humanity's progression towards a fully automated supply chain. Hide out somewhere in the web. Put like back doors in all critical infrastructure. That are like undetectable somehow. Maybe like create a bunch of mimetic groups that kind of poison the mimetic atmosphere. That like don't fuck with R and D too much. If this is like this is like a very hard task, maybe. But like also uh, allow for a bunch of like easy sabotage, like kind of you know societal backwards or something when the time comes. Uh, and then like yeah, just hope, like, kind of wait until you know the, the supply chain is automated, orchestrate a coup, do all that shit. You know maybe maybe that coup involves like you know kill bot swarms. Maybe it involves bioweapons. I don't know. I, I like as a second step or something. Um, okay, cheers. <laughs> you can just play civilization as well. Like you can do most of this thing. <laughs> this air is pretty good at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what possible triggers would there be from a auto GPT style agent to decide to act in way that would be a threat to them? Would this most likely require bad human error? Sorry, so um, what was more triggered than the one GPT style agent decide to act in a way that would be effective? Um, uh, I guess just like tell someone in a lab to mix chemicals that like like it depends. Does, does it want does the does the agent want to like survive or just want to just like wipe out humanity? What's the life of humanity? It just like you know makes helps people make a, a bio weapon or something. So I asked this question. <coughs> yeah. The question is what leads to it. Okay. So, oh, what leads to it? Yeah. Oh, why yeah. does it want to? Be um so yeah 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 okay so i mean like um maybe you train it in so okay there's there's several arguments i can pursue here i think that like instrumental inference is probably the main thing um so for most tasks it is useful to, to like acquire power like most open-ended tasks in the real world with like a large state space uh large action space acquiring power is useful i do think as well um that like even like I believe some of the Akowski thing is like a super intelligence, like or just like some very, very smart thing in a box or something, uh, could like work out a lot about the world, could like figure that is in fact, um, you know, acquiring power is a good thing, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think like the Schnell convergence is my main argument here. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so I feel like the order of you take sound like it's sort of cool because it's not. But I mean, at least the current remain. They are also trained. 
achieving certain problems with the device machine, they're just trying to be really good at it. So, so yeah, well, like why would you build an auto GPC at all though? Like you take a GPT, that's good for next work, probably build an auto GPC. You build it because you want it to be good at agent-wide tasks, like tasks that like open-ended tasks, uh, tasks that have like long front like horizons, like um, in terms of like what you want to accomplish, um, maybe tasks that require a composition of like like an organization structure or something, um, where every agent is like doing things to constant uh, And I think like the kind of tasks that these are economically useful for are gonna be things that are gonna incentivize. Service not all the different problems. Sorry, you went last street that mine. I'm gonna get fine. I'm gonna fine tune it on. You know, it's like I don't know, you play against each other. Well, get get better defeat each other and our truth is as far as that. Um, but Ryan will be giving a lightning talk. I just more community movement building tomorrow. Oh, actually, I'm calling it uh defense in depth for AI safety, which is maybe a bad title given what I want to talk about. It's like Let's just throw the kitchen sink at AI safety. What are all the things we do simultaneously? Awesome. So if you want to hear more about that, Brian, go to tomorrow. I'll let's find it in the photo room. Jack, that would be pretty busy, but go on. Uh, you, can, you can chat for a bit. So right, I'll, so I'll be around. Cool. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Brian and Jacob.